Most Monday mornings, I sit down and write a column. Today, I'm just going to talk into a microphone and show some slides, something different. As my readers know, I've been carefully watching the back and forth about the federal budget process. These changes, I think, have huge implications for Indian country. Just this week, for example, there's a new House Republican Appropriations Committee report about the financing of health care. Definitely worth a comment or two. But more on that later. This week, I'm going to talk about corn. My family and I lived in the Seattle area for many years. A little more than a year ago, we moved home to the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. We have a little land, so I was eager to experiment and grow things. So much about what I write is on the policy level, a view from afar. But with this, I wanted to see what I could do as an individual, as a consumer, as a producer. What are the challenges? What works? What needs work? The same basic questions I ask myself as a writer. The thing is, I'm on a personal mission of sustainability. I don't have a job in the conventional sense. I work project to project. So it seems to me that a garden must be a key part of that space. I also know from a policy level that we need to change the way we eat. It's a critical element of sustainability and of preventing and managing chronic diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. I also hope it's part of building a healthier community. But enough policy. Let's get back to the corn. We planted a garden with a variety of vegetables, including my favorite, blue potatoes. But the centerpiece of our garden is blue corn. Blue corn is a staple crop in many native communities, especially the Navajos, Pueblos, and Hopis. The corn seeds are 30% higher in protein than sweet corn. I wasn't sure that a corn crop of this nature would make it this far north here in southern Idaho. We had strong winds all summer, and several times the stalks were knocked down. It also took longer for the corn to grow ears. The stalks kept getting taller and taller, six, seven, and eight feet, but no ears. Finally, as September began, we saw, we saw real ears. We've also begun to harvest. Now that we have our corn, we're also taking steps to preserve it. We steamed about two-thirds of the corn and are now drying it throughout the house. Some of the corn is hanging up as decoration. Other ears are in a green horse, greenhouse with lots of air. We also saved many of the ears for seed corn particularly the stunning colors such as the dark red or the marbled blues. Our next, next task in a few weeks will be shuck, to shuck the dry kernels. We plan on grinding some into cornmeal and saving the others for use in stews. Of course we've been eating corn all weekend too. Our favorite is roasted corn. I also have plans for next year. I want to experiment with water, exploring methods that use less. In fact, I plan on planting hoses when I plant my seeds in the spring. As I said, this is an experiment as a consumer, not as a farmer. Can any family grow some of the food? Absolutely. I'm struck by how much we produce this year with just a little effort. But I am also a policy wonk, so I think about how a food policy could improve a community. For example, what if every new housing project automatically included a community garden as part of the deal? Or could powwow grounds that are only used a few days a year become permanent, vibrant weekend markets where people sell and exchange food products? I would also make them community flea markets instead of organizing garage sale at home. People could just take what they wanted to sell, when they want to sell it, and add it to the mix. We have a lot of opportunities to rethink and, well, grow in order to build a sustainable community. For me, that begins with corn. And next week, I want to write about earmarks, but that's a whole other story. I'm Mark Trahant reporting from Fort Hall, Idaho.